Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 33 Angel felt that he would like to spend a day with her before the wedding, somewhere away from the dairy, as at last jaunt in her company while they were mere lover and mistress. A romantic day, in circumstances that would never be repeated, with that other and greater day beaming close ahead of them. During the preceding week, therefore, he suggested making a few purchases in the nearest town, and they started together. Clare's life at the dairy had been that of a recluse in respect to the world of his own class. For months he had never gone near a town, and, requiring no vehicle, had never kept one, hiring the dairyman's cob or gig if he rode or drove. They went in the gig that day, and then for the first time in their lives they shopped as partners in one concern. It was Christmas Eve, with its load of holly and mistletoe, and the town was very full of strangers who had come in from all parts of the country on account of the day. Tess paid the penalty of walking about with happiness, superadded to beauty on her countenance, by being much stared at as she moved amid them on his arm. In the evening they returned to the inn at which they had put up, and Tess waited in the entry while Angel went to see the horse and gig brought to the door. The general sitting-room was full of guests, who were continually going in and out. As the door opened and shut each time for the passage of these, the light within the parlour fell full upon Tess's face. Two men came out and passed by her among the rest. One of them had stared her up and down in surprise, and she fancied he was a Trantridge man, though that village lay so many miles off that Trantridge folk were rarities there. "'A comely maid, that,' said the other. "'True, comely enough, but unless I make a great mistake—' And he negatived the remainder of the definition forthwith. Clare had just returned from the stable-yard, and, confronting the man on the threshold, heard the words, and saw the shrinking of Tess. The insult to her stung him to the quick, and before he had considered anything at all he struck the man on the chin with the full force of his fist, sending him staggering backwards into the passage. The man recovered himself, and seemed inclined to come on, and Clare, stopping outside the door, put himself in a posture of defence. But his opponent began to think better of the matter. He looked anew at Tess as he passed her, and said to Clare, "'I beg pardon, sir. T'was a complete mistake. I thought she was another woman, forty miles from here.' Clare, feeling then that he had been too hasty, and that he was, moreover, to blame for leaving her standing in an inn passage, did what he usually did in such cases, gave the man five shillings to plaster the blow. And thus they parted, bidding each other a pacific good night. As soon as Clare had taken the reins from the ostler, and the young couple had driven off, the two men went in the other direction. "'And was it a mistake?' said the second one. "'Not a bit of it, but I didn't want to hurt the gentleman's feelings, not I.' In the meantime the lovers were driving onward. "'Could we put off our wedding till a little later?' Tess asked in a dry, dull voice. "'I mean, if we wished?' "'No, my love, calm yourself. Do you mean that the fellow may have time to summon me for assault?' he asked good-humouredly. "'No, I only meant if it should have to be put off.' What she meant was not very clear, and he directed her to dismiss such fancies from her mind, which she obediently did as well as she could. But she was grave, very grave, all the way home, till she thought, "'We shall go away a very long distance, hundreds of miles from these parts, and such as this can never happen again, and no ghost of the past reach there.' They parted tenderly that night on the landing, and Clare ascended to his attic. Tess sat up, getting on with some little requisites lest the few remaining days should not afford sufficient time. While she sat she heard a noise in Angel's room overhead, a sound of thumping and struggling. Everybody else in the house was asleep, 
and in her anxiety lest Clare should be ill, she ran up and knocked at his door, and asked him what was the matter. "'Oh, uh, nothing, dear,' he said from within. "'I am so sorry I disturbed you. But the reason is rather an amusing one. I fell asleep and dreamt that I was fighting that fellow again who insulted you, and the noise you heard was my pummeling away with my fists at my portmanteau, which I pulled out to-day for packing. I am occasionally liable to these freaks in my sleep. Go back to bed, and think of it no more." This was the last drachm required to turn the scale of her indecision. Declare the past to him by word of mouth she could not. But there was another way. She sat down and wrote on the four pages of a note-sheet a succinct narrative of those events of three or four years ago, put it into an envelope, and directed it to Clare. Then, lest the flesh should again be weak, she crept upstairs without any shoes, and slipped the note under his door. Her night was a broken one, as it might well be, and she listened for the first faint noise overhead. It came as usual. He descended as usual. She descended. He met her at the bottom of the stairs and kissed her. Surely it was as warmly as ever. He looked a little disturbed and worn, she thought. But he said not a word to her about her revelation, even when they were alone. Could he have had it? Unless he began the subject, she felt that she could say nothing. So the day passed, and it was evident that whatever he thought, he meant to keep it to himself. Yet he was frank and affectionate as ever. Could it be that her doubts were childish? That he forgave her? That he loved her for what she was, just as she was, and smiled at her disquiet as a foolish nightmare? Had he really received her note? She glanced into his room and could see nothing of it. It might be that he forgave her. And even if he had not received it, she had a sudden enthusiastic trust that he surely would forgive her. Every morning and night he was the same, and thus New Year's Eve broke, the wedding day. The lovers did not rise at milking time, having through the whole of this last week of their sojourn at the dairy been accorded something of the position of guests, Tess being honoured with a room of her own. When they arrived downstairs at breakfast-time, they were surprised to see what effects had been produced in the large kitchen for their glory since they had last beheld it. At some unnatural hour of the morning the dairyman had caused the yawning chimney-corner to be whitened, and the brick-hearth reddened, and a blazing yellow damask blower to be hung across the arch in place of the old grimy blue cotton one with a black sprig pattern which had formerly done duty here. This renovated aspect of what was the focus indeed of the room on a dull winter morning threw a smiling demeanour over the whole apartment. "'I was determined to do summer in honour, aren't? said the dairyman. "'And as you wouldn't hear of my getting a rattling good randy with fiddles and, and bass viols complete, as we should have done in old times, this was all I could think of as a noiseless thing." Tess's friends lived so far off that none could conveniently have been present at the ceremony, even had any been asked. But as a fact nobody was invited from Marlott. As for Angel's family, he had written and duly informed them of the time, and assured them that he would be glad to see one at least of them here for the day, if he would like to come. His brothers had not replied at all, seeming to be indignant with him, while his father and mother had written a rather sad letter, deploring his precipitancy in rushing into marriage, but making the best of the matter by saying that, though a dairy woman was the last daughter-in-law they could have expected, their son had arrived at an age at which he might be supposed to be the best judge. This coolness in his relations distressed Clare less than it would have done had he been without the grand card with which he meant to surprise them ere long. To produce Tess, fresh from the dairy as a d'Urberville, and a lady, he had felt to be temerarious and risky. 
Hence he had concealed her lineage until such times as, familiarized with worldly ways by a few months' travel and reading with him, he could take her on a visit to his parents, and impart the knowledge while triumphantly producing her as worthy of such an ancient line. It was a pretty lover's dream, if no more. Perhaps Tess's lineage had more value for himself than for anybody in the world besides. Her perception that Angel's bearing towards her still remained in no whit altered by her own communication rendered Tess guiltily doubtful if he could have received it. She rose from breakfast before he had finished, and hastened upstairs. It had occurred to her to look once more into the queer, gaunt room which had been Clare's den, or rather eerie, for so long, and, climbing the ladder, she stood at the open door of the apartment, regarding and pondering. She stooped to the threshold of the doorway, where she had pushed in the note two or three days earlier in such excitement. The carpet reached close to the sill, and under the edge of the carpet she discerned the faint white margin of the envelope containing her letter to him, which he obviously had never seen, owing to her having, in her haste, thrust it beneath the carpet as well as beneath the door. With a feeling of faintness she withdrew the letter. There it was, sealed up just as it had left her hands. The mountain had not been removed. She could not let him read it now, the house being in full bustle of preparation, and descending to her own room she destroyed the letter there. She was so pale when he saw her again that he felt quite anxious. The incident of the misplaced letter she had jumped at as if it prevented a confession, but she knew in her conscience that it need not. There was still time. Yet everything was in a stir. There was coming and going. All had to dress, the dairyman and Mrs. Crick having been asked to accompany them as witnesses, and reflection or deliberate talk was well nigh impossible. The only minute Tess could get to be alone with Clare was when they met upon the landing. "'I'm so anxious to talk to you. I want to confess all my faults and blunders,' she said with affected lightness. "'No, no, we can't have any faults talked of. You must be deemed perfect to-day, at least, my sweet,' he cried. "'We shall have plenty of time hereafter, I hope, to talk over our failings. I will confess mine at the same time. But it would be better for me to do it now, I think, so that you could not say, "'Well, my quixotic one, you shall tell me everything. Say, as soon as we are settled in our lodging, not now. I too will tell you my faults, then. But do not let us spoil the day with them. They will be excellent matter for a dull time.' "'Then you don't wish me to, dearest? I do not, Tessie, really.' The hurry of dressing and starting left no time for more than this. Those words of his seemed to reassure her on further reflection. She was whirled onward through the next couple of critical hours by the mastering tide of her devotion to him, which closed up further meditation. Her one desire, so long resisted, to make herself his, to call him her lord, her own, then, if necessary, to die, had at last lifted her up from her plodding, reflective pathway. In dressing she moved about in a mental cloud of many-coloured idealities which eclipsed all sinister contingencies by its brightness. The church was a long way off, and they were obliged to drive, particularly as it was winter. A closed carriage was ordered from a wayside inn a vehicle that had been kept there ever since the old days of post-chaise travelling. It had stout wheel-spokes and heavy fellows, a great curved bed, immense straps and springs, and a pole like a battering-ram. The postillion was a venerable boy of sixty, a martyr to rheumatic gout, the result of excessive exposure in youth, counteracted by strong liquors, who had stood at indoors doing nothing for the whole five-and-twenty years that had elapsed since he had no longer been required to ride professionally, as if expecting the old times to come back again. 
He had a permanent running wound on the outside of his right leg, originated by the constant bruisings of aristocratic carriage-poles during the many years that he had been in regular employ at the King's Arms, Casterbridge. Inside this cumbrous and creaking structure, and behind this decayed conductor, the parti carré took their seats, the bride and bridegroom, and Mr. and Mrs. Crick. Angel would have liked one at least of his brothers to be present as groomsman, but their silence after his gentle hint to that effect by letter had signified that they did not care to come. They disapproved of the marriage, and could not be expected to countenance it. Perhaps it was as well that they could not be present. They were not worldly young fellows, but fraternizing with dairy folk would have struck unpleasantly upon their biased niceness, apart from their views of the match. Upheld by the momentum of the time, Tess knew nothing of this, did not see anything, did not know the road they were taking to the church. She knew that Angel was close to her. All the rest was a luminous mist. She was a sort of celestial person who owed her being to poetry, one of those classical divinities Clare was accustomed to talk to her about when they took their walks together. The marriage being by license, there were only a dozen or so of people in the church. Had there been a thousand, they would have produced no more effect upon her. They were at stellar distances from her present world. In the ecstatic solemnity with which she swore her faith to him, the ordinary sensibilities of sex seemed a flippancy. At a pause in the service, while they were kneeling together, she unconsciously inclined herself towards him, so that her shoulder touched his arm. She had been frightened by a passing thought, and the movement had been automatic, to assure herself that he was really there, and to fortify her belief that his fidelity would be proof against all things. Claire knew that she loved him, every curve of her form showed that, but he did not know at this time the full depth of her devotion, its single-mindedness, its meekness. What long-suffering it guaranteed, what honesty, what endurance, what good faith! As they came out of church the ringers swung the bells off their rests, and a modest peal of three notes broke forth. That limited amount of expression having been deemed sufficient by the church builders for the joys of such a small parish. Passing by the tower with her husband on the path to the gate, she could feel the vibrant air humming round them from the louvered belfry in a circle of sound, and it matched the highly charged mental atmosphere in which she was living. This condition of mind, wherein she felt glorified by an irradiation not her own, like the angel whom St. John saw in the sun, lasted till the sound of the church bells had died away, and the emotions of the wedding service had calmed down. Her eyes could dwell upon details more clearly now, and Mr. and Mrs. Crick, and Mr. and Mrs. Crick, having directed their own gig to be sent for them, to leave the carriage to the young people, she observed the build and character of that conveyance for the first time. Sitting in silence she regarded it long. "'I fancy you seem oppressed, Tessie,' said Clare. "'Yes,' she answered, putting her hand to her brow. "'I tremble at many things. It is all so serious, Angel. Among other things I seem to have seen this carriage before, and to be well acquainted with it. It is very odd. I must have seen it in a dream." "'Oh, you have heard the legend of the D'Urberville coach, that well-known superstition of this county about your family, when they were very popular here, and this lumbering old thing reminds you of it.' "'I've never heard of it, to my knowledge,' said she. "'What is the legend? May I know it?' "'Well, I would rather not tell it in detail just now. A certain d'Urberville of the sixteenth or seventeenth century committed a dreadful crime in his family coach, and since that time members of the family see or hear the old coach whenever, um, 
But I'll tell you another day. It is rather gloomy. Evidently some dim knowledge of it has brought back to your mind by the sight of this venerable caravan." "'I don't remember hearing it before,' she murmured. "'Is it when we are going to die, Angel, that members of my family see it? Or is it when we have committed a crime?' "'Now, Tess!' He silenced her by a kiss. By the time they reached home she was contrite and spiritless. She was Mrs. Angel Clare indeed, but had she any moral right to the name? Was she not more truly Mrs. Alexander d'Urberville? Could intensity of love justify what might be considered in upright souls as culpable reticence? She knew not what was expected of women in such cases, and she had no counsellor. However, when she found herself alone in her room for a few minutes, the last day on which she was ever to enter it, she knelt down and prayed. She tried to pray to God, but it was her husband who really had her supplication. Her idolatry of this man was such that she herself almost feared it to be ill-omened. She was conscious of the notion expressed by Friar Lawrence, "'These violent delights have violent ends. It might be too desperate for human conditions, too rank, too wild, too deadly. Oh, my love, my love, why do I love you so?" she whispered there alone. For she you love is not my real self, but one in my image, the one I might have been. Afternoon came, and with it the hour for departure. They had decided to fulfil the plan of going for a few days to the lodging in the old farmhouse near Wellbridge Mill, at which he meant to reside during his investigation of flower processes. At two o'clock there was nothing left to do but to start. All the servantry of the dairy were standing in the red brick entry to see them go out, the dairyman and his wife following to the door. Tess saw her three chambermates in a row against the wall pensively inclining their heads. She had much questioned if they would appear at the parting moment, but there they were, stoical and staunch to the last. She knew why the delicate Retty looked so fragile, and is so tragically sorrowful, and Marian so blank, and she forgot her own dogging shadow for a moment in contemplating theirs. She impulsively whispered to him, "'Will you kiss em all once, poor things, for the first and last time?' Clare had not the least objection to such a farewell formality, which was all that it was to him, and as he passed them he kissed them in succession where they stood, saying good-bye to each as he did so. When they reached the door Tess femininely glanced back to discern the effect of that kiss of charity. There was no triumph in her glance, as there might have been. If there had, it would have disappeared when she saw how moved the girls all were. The kiss had obviously done harm by awakening feelings they were trying to subdue. Of all this Clare was unconscious. Passing on to the wicket-gate he shook hands with the dairyman and his wife, and expressed his last thanks to them for their attentions after which there was a moment of silence before they moved off. It was interrupted by the crowing of a cock. The white one with the rose comb had come and settled on the palings in front of the house, within a few yards of them, and his notes thrilled their ears through, dwindling away like echoes down a valley of rocks. "'Oh!' said Mrs. Crick. "'An afternoon crow!' Two men were standing by the yard-gate, holding it open. "'That's bad,' one murmured to the other, not thinking that the words could be heard by the group at the door-wicket. The cock crew again, straight towards Clare. "'Well,' said the dairyman. "'I don't like to hear him,' said Tess to her husband. "'Tell the man to drive it away. Good-bye, good-bye.' The cock crew again. Hoosh! Just you be off, sir, or I'll twist your neck," said the dairyman with some irritation, turning to the bird and driving him away. And his wife, as they went indoors, 
Now to think of that just to-day. I've not heard his crow of an afternoon all the year afore." "'It only means a change in the weather,' she said. "'Not what you think. Tis impossible.'" End of chapter 33